Ladies and gentlemen, on this pleasant in November morning, I am Rekha Magirwar from Department of Botany. Welcome you all for the inaugural ceremony of two days national online workshop. Chairman Honorable Dr. V. J. Thakre, Principal Shri Shivaji Science College, Amravati, and convener of this workshop. Chief guest and inaugurator Honorable Professor M. K. Rai, Basic Science Research Faculty Fellow, UGC, Department of Biotechnology, Santa Gadge Baba Amravati University, Amravati. The organizing committee members on the dais, distinguished delegates, special invitees, teachers, researchers, honorable MSI members, media person, and dear students who have joined through online platform. It is a glorious moment to extend my warm wishes on behalf of the organizers of two days national online workshop on fungal systematics and technological advances. This event is organized by Department of Botany, Sri Shivaji Science College, Amravati, in association with Mycological Society of India, Mumbai Unit, MSI Mumbai. This joint venture will certainly launch wave of mycology research just down the memory lane, MSEBA 2012, organized by our college. Dear participants, let me brief about the schedule of this workshop. It comprises of four technical sessions wherein the renowned mycologists from our country will guide us on various topics of mycology. The unique feature of this workshop is conduction of assignment on day one and assessment competition on the second day to declare tomorrow's mycologist. As lamp symbolizes enlightenment and to render the Occasion, a traditional touch, I request our respected dignitaries on the dais to light the lamp and garland the portrait of our founder president, late Punjab Rao alias Bhausaib Deshmukh. Please. I pay my tribute to the great visionary. Dear participants, please join with us for this historic moment.
Thank you so much, all the dignitaries. Happiness radiates like the fragrance from a flower and draws all good things towards you. I request Professor B.K. Dorkar to present bouquet to Dr. V.G. Thakre, the chairman for this inaugural ceremony. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. V.G. Thakre, convener of this workshop, to extend a warm welcome with a floral bouquet to Honorable Professor M.K. Rai, the chief guest and inaugurator of this national online workshop. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to convey my heartfelt gratitude to Honorable V.G. Thakre for presiding over this inaugural ceremony and Professor M.K. Rai for accepting the invitation and inaugurator for this national online workshop. It is an opportune moment to refurbish and discuss upon the issues in the field of mycology with our esteemed speakers and renowned mycologists. The Sri Shivaji Science College is leading institution imparting science education under the aegis of Sri Shivaji Education Society Amravati and the second largest educational society from the state of Maharashtra, founded by late Dr. Punjab Rao alias Bhau Sahib Deshmukh. So, being a premier institution sharing huge responsibility of education and research, it's really a proud moment for us to organize this national workshop through our stakeholders. An alliance with Mycological Society of India, Mumbai, UNIT, will also make this workshop more fruitful. MSI covers all areas of fungal research, including fungal diversity, ecology, cell biology, and physiology, pathology, genomics, medicinal effects, mushroom biology, and bioremediation. Their participants, mycology is not stagnant but it is like a flowing river. Ha, huh? not a polluted river, but beautiful fresh water stream. We believe in disseminating of knowledge by holding such workshop and knowledge becomes power when we put into practice. So the goal of this workshop is to provide a substantive overview of the basic and emerging role of mycology. Now I request Professor B.K. Dorkar, head of the department and co-convener of this workshop for his welcome speech. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rekha. Good morning to one and all. It is my pride privilege to warm welcome to all the dignitaries scientists, industrialists, faculty members, researchers, and dear students. On the occasion of inaugural ceremony of two days, National Online Workshop on Fungal Systematics and Technological Advances, Department of Botany, Shivaji Science College, Amravati, in association with Mycological Society of India, Mumbai, MSI Unit Mumbai, organized this event. Let me brief, brief about the Department of Botany. This department is established in 1958 as one of the leading departments in the field of teaching and research in plant sciences. Initially with graduation program, keeping pace with advances in various aspects of plant sciences in 1977, we got the recognition of research center to undertake the MPhil and PhD courses. The department offers MSc in Bioinformatics as an interdisciplinary course, which is on sale by finance basis since 2009. I feel proud to mention that the Department of Botany has organized this two-day online national workshop. This workshop consists of more valuable and applied concepts in the field of mycology with reference to fungal systematics and technological advances. In this workshop, 
effective contribution of togetherness and collaboration of mycology as well as systematics in practical way will be approached this workshop would also be for every youngster young researchers i hope that this workshop will provide golden opportunity for the students teachers and researchers to gain the and share the knowledge with the renowned mycologists thank you very much thank you so much sir it gives me immense pleasure to welcome honorable dr sunil deshmukh the president of mycological society of india mumbai unit dr deshmukh has put in tremendous efforts in organizing this event mainly the association of msi mumbai this unique collaboration has reflected in attracting more than 1000 participants for this event i feel this association will certainly be a milestone episode in the history of collaborative events i have a great pleasure to introduce this dynamic personality with multiple facets dr s k deshmukh is industrial mycotechnologist with 35 years of professional experience and pioneer in indian keratinophilic fungi and dermatophytes and evaluation of their biotechnological potential in leather industry and poultry food products he has played key role in establishing two private industrial microbial culture libraries and established and validated 10 novel techniques for cultivation of rare mushrooms he has published more than 120 research papers book articles conference proceedings articles and edited nine books on various aspects of fungi he has guided more than 40 phd mtech students as co-guide and mentor he has been president and vice president of mycological society of india and delivered many lectures in various events mainly the show memorial lecture he is also an expert committee member of dbt biocare i would like to request him for his introductory remarks please sir thanks good morning one and all uh, particular i i am thankful to dr roy to join us actually this is two line two days online workshop and systematics in association with sri shivaji science college and msi mumbai unit if you talk of mumbai unit this was actually created to disseminate the knowledge of fungi to students and young researchers to encourage them to work on various aspects of mycology and recent trends in mycological research and their industrial applications the main objective were to disseminate secondly to give the hands on training by workshop and the giving the arranging the conferences arranging the invited presentations of researchers both from india and abroad help in arranging academic industrial partnership and career counseling and networking to arrange the field trips from time to time for giving knowledge about the macrophagi about msi it was established in 1973 under the when at the time of establishment professor t sadashivan was first president mn kadar kamat as a vice president professor k g mukherjee as a treasurer and professor c v suranam as a editor of kauka that is the transaction of indian mycological society msi mumbai unit was established in 2005 the idea of this unit was at that time was to give a exposure to the students to get a job in particularly in industry as well as into the laboratories the idea of this was came up in the concept around 2002 in the annual general meeting of msi and unit was established in 2005 we have organized first workshop in 2005 on the medical mycology in ruya college mumbai since then we are organizing conferences on various aspects of my mycology annually the presentation presentations in this were made by all well known mycologists like professor let k natarajan dr suranarayan dr bhart dr manorachari dr atri and so on taking the advantage of corona pandemic we have started our activities through virtual means which is easy to disseminate the knowledge 
We have arranged around 20 webinars on various aspects of fungi since May 2020. The experts include Professor D. L. Oxford, CVE, the past president of British Mycology Society, Dr. Rajiv Jeevan from Mauritius University. Then we have the speakers like Professor Surnarayan, Professor Bhagyaraj, Dr. DJ Bhatt, MB Deshpande, Dr. Sridhar, Raghu Kumar, all past presidents. We have also the presentations by the industrial person like Dr. Lakshmi Narayan from AG Biotech System Limited, Hyderabad. And we are planning for many more in the line, including some industrialists from US who have started the work, we started the companies, as well as some from Indian companies owner. We have covered the topics of basic science, including classical and molecular taxonomy, application of fungi in pharmaceutical, cosmeceutical, green synthesis of nanoparticle, biocontrol, biofertilizer, biofuel, to name few. Online workshop on fungal systematics and technical advances is organized in association with Sri Shivaji Science College and MSI Mumbai unit will give an insight of fungal taxonomy and fungal endophytes and resilience of plant to climate change. The speakers are experts in the respective field and the participant will definitely benefit by the, their experience. Chairperson for each session are also reputed persons like Professor Manora Chari of Spawn University, Professor Lakhan Pal from Himachal Pradesh University, Professor Yashpal Sharma of Jammu University, and Dr. Shilpa Vedekar from the Parle Agro Limited, Mumbai. We, I welcome all the participants on behalf of organizers and uh, I am thankful to principals Dr. Thakre and Shivaji Education Society and both the organizing secretaries for arranging this workshop. Not taking much time, I request organizer to proceed further. Thank you so much, sir. The organizers of this workshop have come out with a compilation of articles by eminent mycologists and researchers from the department, along with good wishes in the form of e-souvenir. It gives us immense pleasure to release this e-souvenir at this particular moment. In this inaugural ceremony, I request the technical expert to kindly release the e-souvenir. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, indeed, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome Honorable Professor M. K. Rai, Basic Science Research Faculty Fellow, UGC, Santa Gargi Baba Amravati University, Amravati. It's a proud moment for all of us to mention that recently he's listed in the top 2% scientists in mycology from India. In the data generated by Stanford University, worldwide. It's a special honor for us as he belongs to our Vidarbha region. And we are having such an eminent personality of international repute as a chief guest and inaugurator for this national workshop. We must congratulate him for his recent innovation of mask with silver nanoparticles. He is former head of the Department of Biotechnology Santa Garge Baba Amravati University, Amravati, and worked in the capacity of Member of Senate and Academic Council, Chairman of Board of Studies, Member of Research and Recognition Committee, Member Government Nominee Selection Committee of different universities, Member 10th Plan Committee UGC, and Coordinator SAP Special Assistance Program UGC, Coordinator FEAST Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. In all, 25 students are awarded with doctoral degree under his able guidance and four students are presently working. 
Three students have completed MPhil and 65 dissertations for post graduation. He has published, oh my God, 380 research papers in national and international journals, along with 45 books and 100 popular articles. His H index is 49 and seven patents are to his credit. He is recipient of many awards and fellowships of India and abroad, like Honorary Research Associateship, Sydney, Australia, Visiting Scientist Award, Turin, Italy, Associateship by TWAS Italy to work on AM Fungi in Brazil, Visiting Scientist Department of Biotech, Bioenergetics, University of Geneva, Switzerland, Hungarian Scholarship, Awarded Austrian Scholarship. He has contributed in Advisory Board of International Medicinal Mushroom Conference held in Croatia. Dear participants, this national workshop would have been incomplete without the graceful presence of Honorable Professor M.K. Rai. We are all aware of his enthusiasm and encouraging approach towards research and innovative methods. May I request Honorable Professor M.K. Rai to kindly guide us on to make this workshop successful and to be kind enough to declare that the workshop is inaugurated. Please, sir. Good morning, everyone. Oh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, today my joy has no bound to be here this morning to share my views on the occasion of two-day workshop on systematics and technological innovations. I want to congratulate uh, the team of Sri Shivaji College Botany Department, particularly Dr. Dilip Hande, Professor Ganesh Dao, and their complete team who endeavor to organize such kind of program, which is the need of our. I would also congratulate the president of MSI Mumbai unit, Dr. Sunil Deshmukh, who has taken a lead to generate the awareness regarding the systematics and advancement of mycology in India and abroad. Today's talk is majorly focused on systematics, morphology, and molecular biological aspect of classification. I want to mention here that when we go for identification of fungi, most of the students and even the teachers, they, they think that taxonomy is a tax on me because it is a very hard subject. They think it is taxon, uh, uh, tax. And as a result, the taxonomy is diminishing. The taxonomists are now becoming endangered species. It's pity. I would like to mention here, Professor David Hawksworth, who wrote a paper in 1997 and said, rather remark that taxonomy has become, mycology has become an orphan science. He said, mycology is woefully neglected now. And therefore, now the interest in systematics is decreasing. Although mycology is a mega science, the people are neglecting it. And neglect is so much that even in UNESCO recognized courses of sciences, mycology has not included as a separate subject. What has been included then? It is mushrooms which have been included in botany and yeast in microbiology. Do you think our mycology is over with mushrooms and yeast? So now the question is why they are neglecting and why uh, why we people are not interested in systematics and mycology. It's because the taxonomies are decreasing nowadays. 
the number of taxonom novices is reduced they are countable at the fingertips and the interest is more on applied subjects and applied aspect of mycology this is a good sign but what about the mega science mycology which gives a lot in human health which gives a lot in food security we have the novel microorganisms novel fungi like neurospora crassa and saccharomyces cerevisiae it is a question of bread it is a question of idli and dosa it is a question of fermentation where mycology is applied then why it is not a mega science what is happening and uh, dr hawksworth suggested the mycoaxin plan in this regard he said we have to take x now this is the right time when we go for education we go for collaboration we should go for promotion and conservation of these fungi fungi i am happy that sri shivaji college has started inculcating the values of mycology and developing uh, awareness attitudes and skills for the identification and applied aspect of mycology in collaboration of mycological society of india mumbai unit uh, in the leadership of dr sunil deshmo now i would like to talk on taxonomy because this is a basic subject and uh, this is generally required and the topic of today is systematics and technological advances i want to go back to the taxonomy criteria when the taxonomy was totally depended on post alone people were taking the leaves plucking leaves identifying in the laboratories and sending it to commonwealth mycological institute the name has been changed now and that time rice sutton punithalingam uh, and others were great scientists taxonomists and on the basis of this thousands and thousands of species were uh, erected now what is happening if you don't get the identification of host plant then you won't be able to identify the species or the gen genus and moreover uh, on the basis of host alone if you will see i would give the example of forma exigua it is found on several several plants so now the situation is more difficult on the basis of this several species were created and one taxonomist remarked that one day will come that the taxonomist will fall with its own weight because of a large number of species in the world then in 70s the scientists like one hours gh borema of plant protection institute netherland and some indian scientists like professor r c rajak professor kamath and others those who who thought that the taxonomy should not depend on host alone but it should be based on morphological and cultural characters and from 70s to 90s we worked on morphological and cultural characters and a large number of species which were the uh, design on different hosts were reduced to a small number of species for example uh, many species of forma were reduced to 220 species in wageningen in netherland and one hours reduced 750 species to 11 dot groups and this way the species were reduced then third wave of taxonomy came and that is molecular based identification in the mid 90s after the discovery of pcr by kari mullis in 1985 people started working on molecular biology then what happened the number of species i would like to give two or three examples one forma and phylostricta collatotrichum and uh, pithium many species of forma 
have been categorized in different species like Boremia, Boremia by Everscam, Johannes Gruiter, and Crowell's house. There are scientists who are working. In that time, Wandra, uh, who was the director of CBS Culture Collection Center in Netherlands, who, who was uh, in the opinion of morphological and cultural characteristics, those species were also categorized in a small number. So many species which were categorized in forma were shifted to Escochita and Phyllostricta, and those which were in Phyllostricta or forma were categorized in Escochita and vice versa. Astonishingly, the genus Colotricum has been shifted to order Glomerulus. Now, from De Deutromycotina shifting this genus from Deutromycotina to Glomerulus is really a wonder because in Glomerulus, mostly uh, mycorrhizal fungi are categorized. So, such a drastic change with the help of molecular biology. And the consensus is to use ITS RDNA technology. But this is okay for Pseudomycetes fungi. What about other fungi, for example, Cetosporium or Aspergillus? So we'll have to go for uh, translation elongation factors, beta tubulin genes, and actin genes. And now there is a concept of DNA barcoding. Because DNA barcoding, DNA barcode is a small conjured reason of 500 to 700 or 800 base pairs. And this has generated a revolution all over the world. And after this, more recently, people have started identifying the fungi with the help of Malditov. Metric assisted laser dissolves an ionization mass spectrometry. And most of the bacteria, most of the yeast have been identified. I know a person, very famous, Marcus Eberlin in the University of Campinas in Brazil, who works on identification of these yeast and bacteria. But unfortunately, a few fungi can be identified because the fungi has different kind of fruiting bodies, different stages, secondary metabolites, and so on. So it is a major limitation. And coming to the point now, in 2011, uh, regarding the speciation of fungi, one fungus, uh, one fungus, one name uh, principle has been originated. Uh, uh, and the scientists, they said in International Botanical Congress, which was held in 2011 in uh, Melbourne, they decided now the, there is no necessity for Latin description. You can describe the fungus in English as well and digitally also. And this applied from 2012. Finally, I would like to urge upon the young scientists, the young mycologists, to start identifying some species to save mycology, to save taxonomy, until unless you start, uh, be it uh, morphological character or, or molecular characters or molecular markers, but it started now. The need of our is to save taxonomy, generate awareness, and as a take home message, I would like to say one fungus, one mycologist, if you are, if you are working with one fungus unit and if you are specializing, we will have the expertise like once there was expertise in CMIQ London. With these words, I would like to declare this two day workshop open. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir for your sparring and motivational talk. It must have enlightened the participants. We are indebted to you for inaugurating this event. Thank you so much. Fellow participants, uh, the backbone of this event, key person of our institutional progress, the inspiration of this event and a great motivator, none other than our principal, Dr. Vijay Thakre will now grace the event with his presidential address. Please, sir.
the outset i pay my tributes to a great visionary and the founder of this education society dr bau saheb deshmo who has founded this education society was a great visionary and the shri shivaji science college is one of the well reputed institute of shri shivaji education society the department of botany of our college is organizing this two days national online workshop on the fungal systematics and technological advances <laughs> on this 29th and 30th of november for this inaugural function we have the inaugurator a uh, internationally recognized mycologist dr m k rai as inaugurator of this workshop we have with us the president of the mycology society of india mumbai unit president dr sunil deshmukh the organizing team from the department of botany sir dorkar uh, head of the department of botany dr hande as a convener dr hedau and the entire faculty members of the department of botany dear participants students faculty members researchers person from the industries and the scientific institutes at the outset i welcome you all for your participation in this national event on behalf of shri shivaji science college amravati department of botany this two days national workshop on the mycology uh, online because since march 2020 we are in a phase of pandemic covid 19 and since then all the different activities all we can say the educational activities which we are being organized they are on online the face to face activities are at present it's not possible and our college is organizing the various activities online and this is one of them dr s k deshmukh has rightly pointed out the motive behind organization of this two days national workshop which provides the hands on training to the young scientists students in the field of mycology and definitely this will serve the purpose yesterday i had a discussion with the organizers i think that around 11000 participants are being registered for this which includes some of the participants from abroad also so this number itself speaks about the success of the steps taken by the department of botany and the institute for organizing this workshop and i hope that definitely as some concrete output will be there in these two days dr rai has pointed out clearly that he has congratulated the department and faculty members for taking the initiative in the field of mycology to inculcate the interest of the students in the field of mycology i would like to say here sir this is not the first time it was a very uh, we can say in 1970s in the year 1976 the our laboratory that is department of botany is recognized as a research center by then nagpur university when there were no post graduate courses as well as research centers in the affiliated colleges at that time dr v r gude was the principal of this college who is working in the field of microbiology and the field of mycology and since then this department is working in this field that i would like to mention here and since 1976 ours was the first laboratory of undergraduate college which was recognized as a research center and that too in the field of mycology so this is a unique feature that i would like to quote here so in the same lines then our present faculty members are taking it ahead in the 2012 the department has organized a national conference again in association with the mycology society of india and now this two days workshop is being organized so these are our efforts to train our students to create a interest among the students in the field of mycology and this department is taking the efforts so at the end i must congratulate and thanks all the organizers the department of faculty members for taking this initiative and organizing this two days national event 
for the benefit of the students as well as for the benefit of the society and for the benefit of the mycology so i congratulate all of them for this successful organization and i wish the workshop the best wishes and the definitely in this two days celebration some concrete outcome will be there so with these words i will conclude my presidential remark thank you for inviting me to preside over this function thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for your presidential address we are highly grateful to you for your constant guidance guidance and support thank you so much ladies and gentlemen the successful event is an outcome of a seamless teamwork guided by a perfect leader professor dilip hande in the capacity of one of the organizing secretary has taken lot of efforts and involved the entire team for making this event a grand success may i now call upon professor dilip hande to propose vote of thanks good morning <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen honorable chairman of inaugural cinebani the chief guest and the inaugurator office bearer of mycological society of india senior mycologist honorable chairman of various sessions guest speakers professor teacher industry person research scholar and dear student of the different part of the country in the capacity of organizing secretary of this two day national online workshop on fungal systematics and technological advances organized by department of botany sri shivaji science college amravati in association with mycological society of india mumbai unit mumbai i feel proud and privilege to propose the vote of thanks dear participant and respected invitee while searching for the most important contribution for this event with whom i must being acknowledge to honorable dr vij thakre principal of this college who remain present in the chairman of today's inaugural function the word of gratitude definitely will not be enough to acknowledge you sir as you untiringly supported us to organize this grand event we are fortunate to have an enthusiastic and adorable personality <laughs> professor m k rai bsr fellow senior mycologist department of biotechnology sant gadge baba amravati university amravati as an inaugurator for this event sir your presence on this occasion is much more advantageous for us we are highly grateful to you for inaugurating this event and enlightening us the glory of workshop is heightening by dr s k deshmukh president msi mumbai unit we are thankful to you sir for accepting our invitation collaboration of the workshop with msi mumbai unit and sparing your valuable time constant inspiration encouragement and making this workshop a memorable event i express my sincere thanks to professor b k dorkar head department of botany of the college for his constant inspiration to organize this event national workshop is really the paramount task for all of us we are obligated specially to the our departmental team convener member of various organizing committee of this event for their efforts for overwhelming response to the workshop <clears throat> thanks to all participants staff members students of various part of the country who have taken the efforts for the participation in the event finally i express my sincere thanks to all those who have contributed in whatever possible way to make this event a success and whose name i might have forgotten to mention here once again thank you very much and wishing you the good luck thank you very much thank you dr hande on behalf of the president i declare that the inaugural ceremony is over dear participants kindly stay connected as the chronicle of events as mentioned in the brochure will be continued here after and immediately we are going to begin with the technical session
Immediately we are going to start. Good morning, uh, all of you, once again. On behalf of the organizing committee, I, Dr. Rekha Magirwar, take this opportunity to welcome you for the first technical session. I'm really privileged to have the pleasant task to invite eminent personalities for today's session. Honorable Professor Manorachari, Emeritus Professor, Department of Botany, Osmania University, Hyderabad, as a chairman for this session. His biodata literally runs into volumes, having received a number of prestigious honors, awards, and medals. He has completed his education from Osmania University, Hyderabad, and postdoctoral research at UK, USA, Germany. He is former Nasi Senior Scientist and Platinum Jubilee Fellow, Department of Botany, Osmania University. His research areas are mycology, plant pathology, fungal biotechnology, and microbiology. He has worked as a head of the department, vice principal, principal, chairman of board of studies in botany, dean, and emeritus scientist. He is a recipient of Young Scientist Award Base Teacher Award, Dr. Birbal Sahani Medal, AP Scientist Award, Dr. E.K. Janki Ambal National Award, Lifetime Achievement Award, MSI Lifetime Achievement Award. He was President, Indian Phytopathological Society, Chairman, Research Advisory and Monitoring Committee, BSI and ZSI, President, Indian Botanical Society, President, Mycological Society of India, Member Task Force Biofertilizers and Biopesticides, UGC, nominee for CAS Botany Madras University. I have a great pleasure to welcome you, sir, and I kindly request you to chair this technical session. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have Dr. T.S. Surya Narayanan, Director Vivekananda Institute of Tropical Mycology, Chennai as a speaker for this session. He is such an eminent personality, actually needs no introduction. But it's my proud and privilege to say a few words about him. It's really an honor to mention that he is listed in top 2% scientists in mycology from India in the data generated by Stanford University worldwide. He has 30 years of research experience in mycology, Awarded Fulbright Fellowship and was Honorary Research Associate, University of Canada and Germany. Professor Sidney Alton, Nobel Laureate and Sterling Professor of Molecular Biology, Yale University. He has guided 12 PhD and 30 MPhil students, conducted 10 research projects. He has internal research collaborations with universities in USA, Canada and Germany published 90 research papers in national and international journals, published 12 books, chapters, and abstracts in 48 symposium proceedings. His research publications are cited in Nature, PNAS. He is recipient of many distinctions and honors. 
Dear participants, please welcome Honorable Dr. T. S. Surya Narayanan. Today, he is going to deliver a talk on the topic Fungal Endophytes and Resilience of Plants to Climate Change. I request him to start with his presentation. Please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you. Are you able to see me? Can you unmute? Sorry? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning. And can you see me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, thank you very much. So, I will uh, start by sharing my screen so that I can begin my talk. Let me see. Yeah, um, okay. So, can you see this slide now? No, not yet, sir. Yeah, uh, you just you share see? the PowerPoint, sir. Sorry? Uh, please open the PowerPoint and then share. Keep it open, uh, and then you can share. Yeah, it says that I, uh, I am already sharing. Are you able to see the slide or not? No, no, no. It's your window, your computer window having the files. We need to have the PowerPoint opened and then share the PowerPoint window. Yeah, now it's open, sir. Is it okay now? Yeah. So, can I go ahead? Can I start my talk? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, now it is 11.20. So, how long can I go? Half an hour. Three minutes, sir. Sorry? Around 50 minutes. Around 50 minutes. Okay. Okay. So, thank you very much. And uh, um, so, I'm going to talk on uh, uh, endophytic fungi and how we can possibly use them uh, to alleviate the problems faced by plants due to climate change. So now quickly, of course, we all know what climate change is, but just to, you know, uh, capture the, the temper of the talk, I'm just briefly explaining uh, this climate change that is, uh, that we are experiencing now. So in the last few years, the global temperature has started rising, rainfall patterns have changed and they are still undergoing changes. The major reason for this cause of climate change is uh, it has been found that this is due to the following. So we have the globe and in the atmosphere we have the gases which form an envelope and in here you have different types of gases. Um, some of them like the methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. There are other gases as well, but these three are uh, called the greenhouse gases. The reason for that is uh, when the sunlight strikes the surface of earth, of course it is, it warms the earth and then it is used for uh, photosynthesis by plants, some wavelengths are used and all that. But then um, after absorption of these various wavelengths of light from the sun, there is going to be reflection or you know, uh, release of these uh, light waves back. And that will be in the form of long wavelengths like infrared, which is heat. And most of the released heat would escape. But these three gases, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, they don't allow the heat to escape. 
they absorb they trap the heat and send them back to the surface of the earth that is why life exists on this planet so there's some some warming is there which is necessary but what we see now is in the last uh, some few years especially after the the industrial revolution because of the human activity anthropogenic emission of carbon dioxide especially carbon dioxide has increased a lot so that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is very high and because of that most of the wavelengths of infrared i mean the, the far red light which is which is uh, heat and um, it, it doesn't escape so they are reflected back and because there is an increase in carbon dioxide concentration here more light is more heat is absorbed and it is reflected back so you see a general warming of the uh, the surface of the earth and that has a lot of um, impact on life and also uh, other uh, climatic factors see for example in this uh, slide uh which you can download from climate.nasa.gov and you can sh it shows the amount of carbon dioxide in the year let us say 1950 that is around 400 parts per million if you have a million uh, molecules of uh, atmospheric gases 400 of these molecules should be carbon dioxide which is uh, very high when compared with the amount of carbon dioxide that was present in the atmosphere of this globe of the earth if you look at say 100000 years back or 200000 years back or you go back like this up to 800000 years back the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in earth's atmosphere was uh, almost at uh, 250 to 60 parts per million and only after the the industrial revolution you see the increase in the level it's almost double and it 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 is not stopping it is growing up further so with more of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere more of heat will be absorbed more of the sun's reflected heat would be absorbed and more of it would be sent back to the earth and the warming of the surface of the earth will increase okay if uh, some of you have this doubt how do we know how much carbon dioxide was present say 600000 years back uh, one of the methods to know that is uh, to go to regions like the antarctic and then dig uh, in the snow where um, um, there has not been any human um, um, activities dig into the snow deep uh, or in in the ice deep into this and then get a core out of it so you have a core of uh, a column of ice that you have taken and uh, one can uh, uh, you know uh, measure the age of this as you go from the top if you go down the the, the snow that was formed or the ice that was formed uh, 100000 years will be here and 200000 years will be here you can measure that you can age it by uh, um radio um you know you know using nuclear uh, isotopes and then there are also gas bubbles which have been trapped in this uh, ice core so you can one can sample these gas bubbles and find out how much of carbon dioxide or any other gas is present so that is one way by which we can know roughly the amount of carbon dioxide or any other gas that was present in the atmosphere much earlier so now so what is this uh, warming um what what is what would be the effect of this uh, climate change or or global warming it is predicted that there will be more droughts there will be more heat waves and then the the rainfall pattern will change we are observing that even now there were rainy seasons during particular months you will get some rain but those seasons are now uh, shifting then uh, the temperature surface temperature of earth will continue to rise sea level will rise due to uh, the melting of uh, ice from the polar regions uh, 
and it can it can rise uh, to 1 to 8 feet in another 80 years that is the prediction so most of the coastal uh, um, cities may be even submerged and they say that uh, they can expect stronger uh, hurricanes or, or even um, uh, the storms due to this uh, climate change so now let us see the, this what we have uh, seen here what we have explained as uh, expected changes to, to climate change uh, is all uh, for here it is all for the the weather conditions now let us see what this climate change or global warming what effect would it have on uh, animals and plants um, first thing is uh, global warming it is uh, predicted that will affect species distribution and also the interaction between different species which will also affect finally ecosystem functioning because it is a cascading effect and then it can this global warming could uh, cause extinction of many species some people equate this expected extinction to the mass extinctions we have had in the previous uh, in, the, in the past uh, so they call it it could be equal to a sixth mass extinction event so it is predicted that many species would disappear then uh, climate change through global warming could disturb plant communities how do they how can they disturb they can uh, disturb the distribution of plants we find that certain plants are, are confined to the to the tropics certain plants are confined to the subtropical regions so as the temperature uh, and the uh, as the temperature decreases when we go from the tropics up or down um, the type of plants that we get uh, also change the vegetation changes because of the adaptations that the plants have had during the course of evolution you cannot uh, uh, grow as plant which is found in the subtropics you can't grow it in the temperate or in the in the in the in higher altitudes in the in the alpine region or things like that but with the global warming the temperate region could become warmer and then because it becomes warmer, the plant which have been adapted to survive in cold temperatures may become extinct. And the plants which are the subtropical region, which could not migrate to the temperate region because of the low temperature, now can migrate because the temperature there is conducive. So these are expectations. And then uh, the flowering pattern could change, nectar production could change. If nectar production changes, then it could change the visitation by butterflies and other uh, pollinating insects. Photosynthesis rate could change. And then the food that is partitioned to the root, all these things could undergo changes. So then, uh, so what, what uh, would be the, the effect of climate change um, on, on uh, plants at, at a larger scale? It can lead to range expansion of some plants it could lead to range contraction of plants and uh, as i mentioned it could uh, cause extinction of plants and plant dependent uh, insects and other organisms and then uh, it could also cause invasion by uh, weeds so you see here uh, as i mentioned so these plants here, which are growing in this region, uh, cannot grow even if the seeds uh, ha happen to fall here and uh, they get transported by wind or whatever. Even if they get to this region, they cannot survive because it is pretty cold. And, but due to warming, this place can become warmer and then the seeds that have landed here could germinate and grow. And the plants which have been adapted to low temperature now cannot survive. So there could be shift in the community. 
right? So when when the plant community shifts, it's not a single plant; it's a community shift. Then what happens? The 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 associated organisms, the the, the insects that are associated with this uh, vegetation, the microorganisms, the pathogens, all those things would also shift with those plants to a newer region. So it's actually an invasion, um, and then the already existing plants could even uh, go extinct. So considering all these. Uh, changes that one could expect due to climate change uh, the, the number of studies have been made over the past year so you can see a sudden increase in the number of publications on how plants um, could adapt themselves to the stress this is the blue one is uh, studies on abiotic stress in plants which are induced by climate change and the red one is the biotic uh, biotic stress that could be induced by climate change so you see the number of publications there's a sudden increase in this type of study so it, people have realized that it's a, it's a very serious problem okay now going on to uh, the the overall effects of uh, climate change on uh, not only plants on, let us say on living uh, things there are both positive effects and negative effects uh, see, there could be increased productivity uh, due to warm temperature. Uh, then uh, you can expect uh, some possibility of growing new crops, which are, uh, you know, which are adapted to growing in uh, higher temperatures. Then, um, uh, because of uh, increase in temperature, the seeding or, or uh, flowering. Uh, the time taken for flowering and production of seed could be reduced. So you can probably have, if you have now a, a crop which is growing only for two seasons, probably you can make it grow for three seasons. Then um, you can increase productivity uh, due to enhanced carbon dioxide. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not only more heat, but you could expect more uh, photosynthesis. And even, even C3 plants uh, could uh, produce more because of high CO2, uh, their photorespiration could come down. So these are the, let us say, the expected positive effects. But if you look at the negative effects, um, I already told you crop damage, then um, it's not easy to forecast uh, different uh, changes in the, in the environment. There could be increased uh, insect uh, problem, and then uh, sudden and uh, huge rainfall, on the other hand, there could be increased drought, increased weed growth, because weeds are um, very highly adapted to all these changes. Then these things, uh, and then increased crop disease. And when it comes to humans, there are other. So finally, it is also expected that the pesticides and herbicides that we use uh, for uh, crop production, uh, they are effect could be decreased due to this warming. So it looks like there are more problems than um, positive effects due to this uh, climate change that is going on now. And, okay, so now we are faced with this problem. We have to deal with the negative effects of climate change on crop plants because as I told you already, Climate change models say that drought and salinity will increase and it will affect crop production. So you have on the one hand increasing population and on the other hand climate change is going to reduce crop production. So it's a major problem. So crop loss and increasing population would increase food demand. So there are of course uh, uh, many measures being taken by many international bodies, governments of different countries to reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emission. We know that the carbon footprint and things like that. But in addition to that, um, how can we deal with this when it comes to crop production? The possible solutions are breeding crops, uh, which could be if not resistant, but more 
tolerant to climate change. So one can breed, one can try breeding. The other one is uh, genetic modifications of crops. Uh, so you have uh, uh, metal with the genes and then you modify them and then you get uh, GM or whatever, I mean crops for, for uh, uh, their better performance um, under climate change conditions. But that maybe it could be achieved with all these um, modern uh, techniques which are improving day by day. But then the acceptance, even if you succeed in getting a genetically modified crop, which can grow and produce more seeds under climate change conditions, the acceptance of genetically modified crops in many countries uh, right now uh, is, you know, very poor. People don't accept genetically modified crops. We, we see that in our country too, and many countries in Europe, they, they, they don't accept this. Um, so, so even if genetic modifications are successful, their acceptance uh, is questionable. Then the other way out is, we now know very well that plants are not alone. Plants are associated with different types of microbes like fungi, bacteria, and actinomycetes. And uh, yeah, different types of microbes are associated with each plant. So a plant is not alone. And what we see as a plant and what we see it as a plant's function um, are not just because of the plant alone, but because of also the microbes that are associated with the plant. So nowadays, um, we don't see an individual, including humans and animals, we don't see that as an, as an individual, but we have to appreciate the fact that an animal or a plant, or even let's say human, is a product of that particular organism associating with its microbes. So it's a, it's a, you know, so, so we call it a holobiome. The plant, plus it, if you remove all the microbes, probably the plant won't survive. So the, the, the view of, I mean, looking at an organism as just a mere organism uh, is not, um, you know, it's now, uh, it, that's not the way to do it. And we now have to appreciate the fact that an organism doesn't survive alone. It has got many, uh, especially microorganisms, which are associated with it. And the product is actually an interaction between the associated microbes and the individual. So, yeah. So now, if that is, I mean, when we know that, uh, comes the question, can we, then deal with the microbes which are associated with the plant so that uh, we can improve the, the, the performance of uh, the plant or the crop under uh, climate change conditions. So let's say you have a crop and the crop is, uh, it is associated with various uh, microbes like, you know, mycorrhiza and then uh, um, yeah, uh, root uh, bacteria, like, um, you know, then soil bacteria, then on the leaf, but microorganisms, both fungi and, and bacteria. Then inside the plant, you have endophytes, bacterial endophyte, and then fungal endophyte. So, so it's, it's, it's a complex mixture of microorganisms and the plant. So now, uh, the, let us say the, 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 the global warming um, affects the crop and the crop is unable to perform under global warming. So the question now is, okay, so what we can do is, can we now um, take the, you know, the, 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 can we deal with the microorganisms associated with the plant? And then uh, with that method, can we increase the crop's ability to survive under climate change conditions? Uh, not genetically dealing with it, but by other ways. So that's the question which you are going to see now. 
Uh, as I told you, a, a plant is uh, not alone. It is associated with pathogens, haprotrophs, mycorrhiza, and endophytes. So the climate change will also affect not only the plant, but all these microorganisms associated with that. And, uh, uh, but we do not know, we, we have very little information on the effect of climate change on the microbes that are associated with plants. We have some information on the effect of climate change on plants. When I say plants, it includes crops as well. So we have some information how plants or crops would perform uh, under climate change conditions. But we have absolutely very little information on how the microorganisms associated with the plant would behave. So that is what one should focus on. And in that, let us take off the different types of microorganisms associated. Let us just take endophytes. As I, you all know that endophytes are both bacteria, fungi, which live inside the plant. They are always there. And uh, normally they don't cause any disease. And uh, they are always present uh, uh, within the plant tissue, both root and aerial parts, leaf stem, everywhere, in the flower, in the fruit, in the seed, they are there everywhere. So, now when we start looking at a plant as uh, a combination of the plant itself plus its associated microorganisms, here we are looking at endophytes, so plant plus endophytes, we now talk of the holobiome. So, our idea is, uh, I mean, is it possible to do something to the associated endophytes uh, so that the plant is able to adapt itself? climate change. Um, so here there were some earlier studies uh, which show that there is a possibility of uh, dealing this problem using endophytes. Here is the work of uh, Rodriguez et al. See this is a, 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 in a grass called the dune grass. So you have a, 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 the control plant which is growing under normal soil but here it is uh, grown uh, with salt water. So you can clearly see that salt water um, is inhibiting the growth when compared with the control. Then what is done is a fusarium fungal endophyte is uh, taken uh, and it is introduced or inoculated in this plant and then uh, the plant is grown here without salt again but with salt water here. So. So the difference between this and this is that this is also grown in salt water. This is also grown in salt water, but here it is without the endophyte and here it is with the endophyte. So you can see that the presence of that endophyte um, helps the plant to tolerate salinity. Okay, so now this is a work uh, from um, our own country by uh, Rabaya uh, and uh, Uma Shankar and his team from Agriculture University, Bangalore. So there is a type of rice called Pokali rice, which is grown in uh, Kerala, especially along the coastal region, because it is um, a, a salt tolerant paddy or salt tolerant rice. And then so there is another rice called IR64, which uh, that variety is sensitive to salt. It, it doesn't grow well when, when, when there is salt in, in, the, in the soil. So what uh, Ramaya et al. did was uh, they isolated a fusarium uh, endophyte from this uh, uh, pokali rice, which can grow in salt conditions. And then they inoculated it in, in uh, the salt sensitive uh, IR64 and then they uh, grew it under salt water and they were able to show that when the endophyte goes into this plant it is able to tolerate uh, presence of sodium chloride or salt in the water and is able to grow. The only thing that has happened is inoculated with the endophyte isolated from uh, salt tolerant uh, rice. So, similarly, uh, there is a, a curvularia endophyte 
when inoculated into a plant it increases the drought tolerance of the plant you see for example here the the plant is grown um, this is this trays are without the endophyte here the plant is inoculated with this curvularia endophyte and you see these are three days without water friday five days without watering seven days without watering nine days without watering and up to 12 or even say let's say nine days without watering this plant this plant is not able to grow that much but here it is able to grow that much even without watering for 9 days because of the presence of this endophyte curvularia so you inoculate the plant with curvularia then it withstands drought and not only that uh, amount of seed yielded by the plant in the salt uh, in this drought under drought condition with the presence of endophyte is much more so it looks like here again here is a uh, uh, in in tomato yeah yeah in tomato so there is one endophyte called uh, ampelomyces uh, fungal endophyte if you introduce that in tomato it helps uh, increase the drought tolerance of this plant there is another uh, endophyte penicillium um, penicillium chrysogenum an endophyte which if you inoculate it will increase the salt tolerance in tomato so different endophytes can provide a different type of tolerance so we have been now looking at how inoculating plants with the, simply with uh, endophytes certain endophytes um, increase their abiotic stress tolerance like increased salinity and increased drought which are the most expected changes in the environment due to climate change okay now i also said i also mentioned that climate change could also increase uh, occurrence of pathogens and uh, increase the the pest problem in plants so uh, we have to look at uh, whether uh, endophyte Uh, inoculation with certain endophytes can also increase the biotic stress tolerance of plants we have a, a, a very well cited work of uh, arnold et al uh, which have been cited again by clay in nature so you have this uh, theobro um, the cocoa tree and uh, it is uh, it has a very serious uh, pathogen uh, called the uh, colit i'm sorry phytophthora so it causes uh, this decay of the leaf phytophthora uh, on on cocoa it's a very serious disease but then they found that uh, when uh, this is an endophyte uh, colitotrichum species when that is inoculated in, in cocoa the infection by phytophthora decreases and uh, so um this endophyte colitotrichum uh, endos a uh, cocoa tree with some biotic stress tolerance uh, especially during attack by uh, phytophthora endophyte infection also removes biotic stress in sunflower how does it do um in sunflower they have shown that uh, the, the endophyte infection regulates uh, certain defense hormones increases production of antioxidants and then certain functional amino acids so that way perhaps the the, the endophyte uh, presence uh, increases the tolerance of uh, plants to uh, the the climate change uh, major at all they showed that when the colitotrichum endophyte which i uh, talked about just now when that colitotrichum endophyte is inoculated in this cocoa tree theobroma cacao uh, that the endophyte increases lot of changes in the gene expression hundreds of uh, the defense related genes which were silent in the cocoa tree get activated when colitotrichum endophyte is introduced so many uh, different genes get upregulated 
either they are um, silent genes or up, uh, upregulated or the the product of those genes the, the, the concentration of the product is increased and so the plant becomes more uh, fit to defend itself so that is a mechanism by which an endophyte could increase the uh, biotic stress tolerance here is uh, another uh, oh i forgot to include uh, from where i took this so this is not mine uh, sorry about that i should have put a reference here but anyway so here so let's say how this works see here is uh, a plant tissue and here is the red one is a pathogen it infects it enters and it grows inside because as the fungus grows in the plant will try to defend itself it will produce uh, um uh, you know um uh, it will have different reactions like it may produce secondary metabolites like uh, phytoalexins or uh, other type of um, reactions to to stop the growth or to arrest the growth of the pathogen but when the pathogen when when a successful pathogen infects first the pathogen as soon as it enters it produces certain special proteins called effector proteins these effector proteins are secreted by the pathogen inside the host and what do these effector proteins do they arrest the immune response of the plant so that the plant is not able to trigger its immunity so the defense of the plant goes down because of these effector proteins which are produced by the pathogen so the pathogen easily enters and infects and grows wherever whichever tissue it uh, specializes in to grow in and get its new tissue what happens when an endophyte infects when an endophyte infects it doesn't produce uh, the effector proteins so because it doesn't produce effector proteins the plant will react uh, it will uh, try to defend itself because there are no effector proteins so the plants can easily fight so what it does is it produces it starts uh, producing some uh, extra wall so the wall, the cell wall becomes very thickened so that the, the penetration of this uh, endophyte will be avoided into the cell the penetration is not there and then um, the, the, there will be cell death death of some cells so that the the the, the pathogen um, uh, you know uh, cannot uh, go to those cells or there will be increase in reactive oxygen species and phytoalexin production and things like that with all this the with these defense reactions with all these defense reaction the host will um arrest the development or the extraordinary growth of the endophyte so the endophyte is not able to grow as invasively as this pathogen because it doesn't produce effector molecules and therefore the host plant system recognizes its presence and arrests the growth of the endophyte however please remember these defense reactions only limit the growth of the endophyte in the plant but they don't eliminate the endophyte they don't kill the endophyte so it's a situation where with reference to endophytes and plant it's a very interesting situation the endophyte cannot cause disease or kill the plant at the same time the plant cannot completely uh, get rid of the endophyte it doesn't it cannot kill the uh, endophyte so there is a sort of a mutual mm, mm, reaction you know um, so i won't kill you you don't kill me but i'll be with you you will be with me it's sort of a chess game that is there now let us say so but it 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 is restricted to certain places it doesn't spread because of the reaction host reaction now let us say here is a plant without the endophyte so the pathogen easily grows and colonizes and causes disease here is a plant with the endophyte which is staying there now the pathogen enters so when the pathogen affects the plant in which already an endophyte is present it is not able to grow that freely as in this plant where there is no endophyte because i told already the endophyte has entered and the defense reaction of the plant has already been triggered so when this plant when this pathogen enters enters um, it's you know uh, 
either it is not able to produce effective proteins or because of the already these physical and chemical reactions the defense reactions of the host due to the endophyte will restrict this pathogen so uh, the plant will start producing new chemicals like pathogenesis related proteins and that those things will restrict the growth of the pathogen so it's clear that when the plant has an endophyte usually uh, the, the the colonization uh, by a pathogen is not very successful okay now let us uh, look at uh, okay that was about uh, fungal infection let's see about uh, insects insects you know are pests which uh, damage uh, plants they they uh, you know that um, so but then there are some fungi which are called entomopathogenic fungi uh, which are specialized in attacking insects uh, they they produce chitinase enzyme degrade the exoskeleton of the insect and get inside and then grow and uh, eat the assimilate the insect uh, uh, cuticle and then they multiply within the hemocele and finally they kill the insect and then they grow out of the insect body and produce uh, spores so that they can spread these are called entomopathogenic fungi it is now known that some entomopathogenic fungi can also exist as endophytes within the plant so that would be interesting because uh, as you know one can think of using such entomopathogenic fungi as an endophyte to control pest because uh, uh, i told you that climate change is expected to increase the population as well as the spread of pests okay so now um quickly just to summarize how does an endophyte infection protect a plant or or helps in in the, in the plant survival the crop survival let us say so you have an endophyte uh, and that endophyte when it enters that endophyte can produce uh, secondary metabolites some of which may be anti pathogenic or they may be even uh, working against the pest so that when endophyte infects and produces some metabolite those metabolites don't do any harm to the host plant but those chemicals could be injurious to the pathogen or the pest uh, insect pest so the infestation or uh, pathogenesis could be reduced alternatively the endophyte once it enters you know as uh, i told you earlier the work of major at all uh, endophyte could interact uh, at the genetic level of the host plant and can upregulate many of the defense genes of the host so that the plant produces numerous defense uh, compounds which were not originally i mean which were not present originally because of the absence of the endophyte and that can again uh, prevent the pathogen or pest from attacking another possibility is an endophyte infects the host plant you know it has a secondary metabolite but let us say that secondary metabolite that chemical um, is not very effective in 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 uh, you know uh, avoiding the or or harming the pathogen or the pest so easily the pest can attack or the pathogen can attack but when the endophyte enters a fungus or a bacterium as an endophyte supposing that endophyte has an enzyme which is capable of converting this less effective plant compound into a more effective compound this is called biotransformation now the more effective compound will be uh, preventing more efficiently the pathogen or the pest uh, uh, from attacking the plant now this biotransformation could take place another possibility is let us say the pathogen the fungus or pa pathogenic fungus or bacterium which enters uh, the plant on infection uh, it uh, depends on a particular type of uh, chemical or food for nutrients nutrition but if the endophyte is there and the endophyte is also using the same nutrients then there is going to be competition between the endophyte and the pathogen or the pest for that and uh, that competition could result in reduced uh, damage to the plant another possibility is uh, 
the uh, renophyte after entering the plant um, you should remember that when an endophyte enters already there are different types of endophytes in a plant tissue there could be different fungal species there could be different bacterial species so when the new endophyte enters there is going to be competition between the native endophytes and the alien one which has entered recently it is just like the interaction that one can see in soil you know in soil there is going to be a lot of interaction between existing fungi and bacteria competition and that could lead to production of antibiotics by certain organisms same thing could be expected here there are already existing endophytes bacterial and fungal and a, a new uh, endophyte comes in so there is going to be interaction between the native endophytes and the alien endophyte that could lead to production of certain chemicals like antibiotics which could prevent uh, the pathogen or uh, pest from attacking so these are all the different ways by which the endophytes can um, react within the host uh, uh, which will favor the, the the performance of the plant under uh, climate change or even natural conditions okay con continuing with um, uh, the why we should concentrate on uh, endophytes because we just now see all, seen all these things which shows that fungal endophyte could be ideal candidate for uh, uh solving to a certain extent the climate change effect on crops uh, now why because they are natural inhabitants of plants we are not genetically modifying them and all that they don't cause disease they are non pathogenic and uh, they have uh, certain traits of abiotic and biotic tolerance which could be transferred to the uh, plant in which they are present now there are a few other points for example fungi have a smaller genome when compared with the host plant they have a short generation time and then they have uh, recombination sexual reproduction methods so when the plant and its endophytes are exposed to climate change um, you can expect higher rates of evolution in the endophytes than in the plants because of this okay so faster evolution and fungi under stressful environments show higher frequencies of new spontaneous mutations so climate change effect could uh, speed up evolution in endophytes uh, and uh, we can i mean we can expect uh, modification we can expect adaptations in endophytes to climate change occurring faster than in the plants then many endophytes belong to this subphylum pezizomycotina they show a novel form of chromosomal evolution called mesosynteny where the genes are conserved within homologous chromosomes but they are randomized in order and orientation so point mutations um, can give you a lot of uh, you know varieties of mutation in the same uh, chromosome because of the randomized distribution of the genes and then um, so okay so we now say that uh, endophytes uh, could adapt faster than the plant to climate change because of their uh, small relatively small genome size uh, faster i mean uh, rapid life cycles uh, turnover in generations etc etc but you should remember all such mutations uh, are may not be good many of them may be deleterious bad but then gradually there is going to be selection pressure and uh, with the continuous uh, uh, climate change uh, scenario the better equipped uh, mutants will survive under such condition so we can isolate endophyte from so what is the idea okay so let us go let us go to a place where there is a lot of where there is a let's say go to a desert in which uh, the water a precipitation or rain is very low and there are, but there are plants growing there so we can expect that the plant is adapted to harsh conditions and also the endophyte which is present within the plant is also adapted to such harsh conditions so we take the plant isolate the endophyte test it whether it is able to grow um, in the uh, absence of water for some period then inoculate it in your crop plant this is another interesting thing 
endophytes are not host specific so we can easily transfer them from um, any wild plant to a crop plant but they may get eliminated but you have to test and then see then uh, look whether they are able to uh, give the plant uh, uh, the stress tolerance so it looks like uh, crops would become resistant to climate change by use of uh, uh, endophytes and it looks very easy but we should remember that uh, there are many things to address before we do this it, it appears simple but it is not so simple because all these studies which so far uh, uh, inducing stress tolerance abiotic stress tolerance or biotic stress tolerance in plants using endophytes are successful in laboratories or in greenhouses but usually it fails in the field when you take it when they will take the crop to the field it fails why this is the thing that we have to address there are some warnings some some caveats before we uh, advocate the use of endophytes for for adaptations uh, to plants in climate change first one global warming is supposed to enhance spread of pathogens as well as their virulence now so what has that got to do with endophytes unfortunately many endophytes species like uh, colletotrichum formopsis xylaria lassio diplodia these are they include pathogens as well so it is possible that today these fungi are very common endophytes in plants but they remain as endophytes um, under this condition but under climate change condition they could switch over to a pathogenic mode and could cause disease so that has to be studied so uh, for example this endophyte uh, called leptospherulina it's a nascomycid it is a, a very commonly seen as endophyte most if you take in groundnut or what you call peanut the leaf 80% of different varieties of leaves will have uh, 80 if you take a leaf and then look at the endophyte fungal endophyte population in the leaf 80% of that would be this fungus different varieties we have seen in tamil nadu and in the united states uh, in in the ground, peanut growing areas this is a pathogen so could climate change um trigger the endophytes to become pathogens if so the use of endophytes in in climate change uh, scenario may not be a good option so we need to study uh, many things about endophytes before we can use them positively uh, there are hardly any information on many things for example how the fungal endophytes interact with the other microbes that are present in the plant microbiome co-occurring one we do not know uh, the alteration in such interaction uh, could uh, could change with the tissue age and uh, the endophyte community could uh, could uh, have different types of interaction because young leaf of a plant would have some uh, species of fungi as endophytes and in the same plant as the leaf ages you see a change in the composition of the species or the population of endophytes within the leaf so the interaction of pathogen or an introduced endophyte when the plant is young and when the plant is old could be different the response of plant endophyte as a holobiont to changes in environment has to be studied in detail so i'm coming towards the end of my talk so if you can bear with me for a few more minutes okay so for example here uh, we found uh, um, an endophyte uh, could be used if you inoculate a plant with a particular endophyte uh, this uh, helicoverpa which is a very common and devastating uh, insect pest on plants uh, could be controlled you know the 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 mortality when when uh, the insect eats the leaf in which we have introduced the endophyte it dies but then so it's it looks very uh, convenient to use this but that was the trichoderma endophyte but then you so what you do is you inoculate the plant it uh, may be cotton or whatever you inoculate 
and then inoculate the plant with a heavy dose of this uh, fungal endophyte. Uh, it grows in and then uh, into the leaf and then the, the, the insect is uh, uh, not using that, um, the insect use, if it uses that leaf, if it eats that leaf, it dies. So it's very effective. But then if you try to recover that uh, inoculated endophyte from the leaf, it goes on, but then it falls. It, 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 it may be there up to 21 days or three weeks. And after that, the endophyte level within the leaves will fall down. You have to re-inoculate after 40 days. So what is the reason for this? The reason could be that there are native endophytes which prevent the colonization uh, of the introduced endophyte. So what is the use of this endophyte? Okay, it temporarily inhibits the attack of the insect. But then you have to spray it every three weeks or four weeks. Uh, not a very efficient method. Now, another thing is we should know, even if you say there is a there is an endophyte which is very effective. I got an endophyte, let us say, from a, from a uh, salt uh, soil. Uh, a plant is growing in a salty soil. I get an endophyte out of it and I show that it is able to tolerate uh, high salt concentration. Uh, I inoculate it in a crop and I show that a crop is able to survive under salt condition. It looks great, but we do not know the details of this. For example, uh, the work of uh, Mark was at all showed that there is an endophyte carvularia uh, which protects a plant when the plant is growing under uh, in, in heated soil. Soil heated up to 65 degrees Celsius. So it looks great. It, it provides a thermal tolerance to the plant. But then they found that the carvularia endophyte has a virus within its hypha. We call it endohyphal virus. If that virus is removed and if you inoculate the plant with the endophyte without the virus, it is not able to protect the plant. So such intricacies are there. So uh, there could be a lot of interactions. One has to look at those things. This is a plant. B could be the uh, dominant endophyte in the plant, dominant species. C is a minor endophyte in the plant and D is a keystone endophyte in the plant and E could be uh, a endohyphal bacterium just like the virus was found within the hypha there could be a bacterium inside the endophyte you call it endohyphal bacterium F is the endophytic bacterium so this is the leaf A is the leaf and all B, C, D, E, F are all different types of endophytes found in that leaf. And the lines that join these things are the possible interactions that are taking place. The leaf could interact with the dominant endophyte. It could interact with the satellite endophyte. It could interact with the keystone species endophyte. It interacts with the endohyphal, I mean, the endophyte having endohyphal bacteria it interacts with the uh, endobacterium, endophytic bacterium. But each one of this, this you just take this endophytic bacterium, it could interact with this, it could interact with this. So you see a multiple interactions are possible. There is a, there is a network of interaction and the, the plant and the traits of the plant that we observe are actually uh, the, the outcome of the total of all these reactions. Uh, so one has to study this uh, by different, uh, perhaps mathematical modeling and such uh, things and uh, computations could help us uh, to decide uh, these interactions, to, to, to know about these interactions and then decide for a particular crop to withstand uh, biotic or abiotic stress, what combination of endophytes we should inoculate very important to okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. and finally uh, we cannot use an endophyte just because it is effective because Sir, many over. yeah i'm coming to the last slide the endophytes could also produce uh, certain metabolites which can harm the plant for example you see a, a plant that is growing here um, it, 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 this is a um, you know um, 
uh, common hydrophyte and then in the presence of the metabolite of the endophyte it 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 is killed so we should take into consideration all these things before we use uh, possible use uh, possibly use endophytes for uh, adaptations uh, of plants under climate change conditions so with this i thank uh, the all of you and also my special thanks are due to dr deshmukh president msi mumbai unit and uh, professor hande organizing uh, secretary of this national workshop i hope my talk uh, was um, um, you know well received thank you very much thank you so much sir, so much, sir. i would like to mention that the talk delivered by honorable dr t s surya narayanan was outstanding and research domain oriented the topic is open for the discussion now and i request all the participants to raise your queries in the chat box and we have received some of the queries sir on behalf of the participants i would like to ask a few queries pramodini pramodinge sorry is asking which are common or specific media used for endophytic bacteria and fungus isolation please sir um there are no such special media you can use um, for fungi you can use uh, pda um, or malt extract agar and uh, for bacteria you can use the normal bacteria i mean medium which are used for uh, isolation of bacteria but if you are interested in let us say um, salt tolerant uh, endophytes then to this medium you can add different concentrations of sodium chloride different molarity and then um, only collect those fungi which grow on high salt concentration and so those will be the so you would have isolated the uh, salt tolerant endophyte so and if you want a uh, uh, heat tolerant endophyte in the same medium can be incubated at different temperatures and then uh, you isolate those fungi which grow at high temperatures so so you can change the situations as such there are no special media for for isolation these are common um, fungi and bacteria which could grow in any medium the animal question there is another uh, question asked by ranjani indu sir how can we differentiate endophytic fungi from the normal fungi yeah that's a good question so uh we are i mean the common method of isolation of endophytic fungi is by um, surface uh, sterilization so when you when i take a plant root or a leaf we know that on the surface of the leaf there are uh, microorganisms let us say fungi and bacteria these are epiphyllous on the leaf so you have to remove them and uh, you should get only those fungi which are present within the organism i mean within, within the organ tissue that is the endophyte so we need to uh, test this by uh, you use usually you use um, either uh, hydrogen peroxide or uh, uh, sodium hypochlorite and ethanol um, for uh, killing the surface organisms and then uh, you plate out the tissue uh, in uh, growth medium and wait for the organisms to grow out and uh, um if your surface sterilization is not uh, effective so the, the the best method would be you you um, you take a leaf and then if you are interested in isolating fungal endophytes from leaf take a leaf and then cut them into small segments and then treat them with the with a chemical which is normally used for surface sterilization a very simple procedure uh Seventy percent uh, ethanol, and then follow it up with uh, sodium hypochlorite, and then wash it in distilled water, and then you plate it out on the medium. Put the pieces on PDA. Um, so, but I am not sure because the leaves can differ in thickness from plant to plant and whatever. So I am not sure if uh, I have killed all the surface fungi on bacteria. So what we do is we can. in a, we have a test uh, plate in which we 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 put this bit and then just gently press it on the medium and then remove it and incubate the plate 
So you should not get any growth of bacteria or fungi in these test plates. If that happens, then whatever fungi you get from the leaf, from the from the inoculated leaf, are all endophytes. Um, however, uh, we are not sure that we are isolating all the endophytes because it, the surface isolation could be strong enough to kill some of the uh, surface endophytes. But you are sure that whatever you isolated are endophytes. Thank you so much, sir. It's time now to listen to the chairman's remark. I request Honorable Professor Manorachari for his valuable remarks. Please, sir. Please un unmute, sir. Sir, please unmute your... Sir, please unmute your unmute mic. Unmute your mic. Chari, sir, please unmute yourself. You are not audible, sir. Am I audible, Chari, sir? Please unmute yourself. Can you unmute from your side? Dr. Deshmukh, you can tell him. I'm, I'm calling, he's not picking the phone. So, this uh, first technical session will be followed by the break and we will be joining again at 2 p.m. for the next technical session. Dear participants, be ready for the assignment today. It will be the instructions for the assignment will be given at the end of the second session. And we hope to receive a huge response from all the participants. Hello, hello. Thank yes, ma'am. Yeah. Will you be, hello, is uh, audible? Will yeah. Manorachari, yeah. sir, for his chairman's remark. Please, sir. Hello. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Surnaranam. He has been considered as a father of uh, endophytes in India. Though he has forgotten about me and uh, to mention, I would like to say that fungal endophytes and resilience of plants to climatic change that he spoke is one of the important topics of this particular century. And um, he has mentioned about the climate change factors that are responsible, the greenhouse effects, and the role of endophytes, the role of endophytes in sustenance of plant biome, including the crop plants, which is very important for the agriculture. And also in avoiding the abiotic and biotic stress, the role of endophytes in relation to that particular aspect that has been demonstrated with reference to physarium, area, and other organisms. And also he has gone through the mechanism of endophytes and also gene regulation he has mentioned and how best the endophytes can offer defense for the sustenance of plants from that of the climate change in alleviating the carbon dioxide effects and uh, other biotic and abiotic uh, effects. And also he has uh, mentioned about the lacunae that are existing as on today. And uh, in that particular uh, uh, field, 
and that uh, on the whole it it is a, a masterly and outstanding uh, keynote address that he has delivered to the participants and then i congratulate professor t s sunanan for having for having been listed in the uh, 2% of outstanding mycologists for his uh, valuable contributions because his citation index and 160 research papers have been quoted uh, by a number of scientists and has been rated very with high impact factor i also congratulate the organizers the principal thakre dorkar dr hande and all other faculty members and also participants for having graced the occasion and also took part in this particular fungal systematics and technical advancement uh, symposium which has been thought uh, which has been thought very well by the organizers i must mention here that i was there in this particular uh, shivaji science college in 2002 delivered keynote lecture in this particular institute and since then i have been in touch and um, i appreciate their concerted efforts and commitment to the mycology and plant pathology now coming to professor deshmukh the president of msi and dr sheshreka the secretary they have been i think this particular msi unit of mumbai has been very active and they have been doing yeoman service to mycology by arranging webinar lectures and so on and so forth and uh, therefore without mycology the sustenance of life is very difficult no fungi no life i take this opportunity to thank every one of you and uh, wish you all the good luck for the remaining day and have a very good training and all that i wish that in in the coming lectures you will be hearing more of fungal systematics and the lacuna that are existing and how best we can improve upon in india and how best we can advance through various technologies including molecular technologies which have become essential as on today thank you very much i thank every one of you and uh, Wish you good luck. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Dr. Deshmukh. Thank you so much, sir. Certainly, your address goes long way in inspiring us to strive hard and achieve more. Thank you so much. No matter what language you speak, a kind and smiling thank you always speaks to everyone's heart. i am humbly honored to propose vote of thanks on this historic occasion we express our thanks and gratitude towards honorable professor c manoracharya for chairing this session and his valuable guidance it's my privilege to place on record my grateful thanks to honorable dr t suryanarayanan for his insightful talk lastly but not the least i must salute to all the participants of this workshop with your presence this event has been one of its own kind let's be together in future as well for such endeavor once again i thank you all for your kind cooperation at last before the break and handing over the further proceedings to dr swati i conclude my words saying success is a vehicle which moves on a wheel of hard work but this journey is impossible without the fuel called self confidence so hope this workshop will guide you further please join at 2 pm sharp for the next session thank you thank you so much assignment